What's up guys, on today's episode, we're not working on one, not two, but three brand new 2018 991.2 GT3s. Now, these two in particular came from Rhode Island, and this one right here, the chalk white one, came from Florida. We're flat bedded up here. Now, you may be asking yourself, why are you detailing and clear brawing uh, brand new cars? Well, it's pretty interesting. These all came out of the factory at the same exact time. So for me, from a nerd perspective, I actually wanna see what's different or what's the same on all three of them, and I think it's gonna be a lot of fun, so we'll go through that. Number two, we're gonna be focusing on the interior glass. Remember, brand new cars, kind of a pain in the butt. There's yellow gunk that's on the inside of the windshield, so I'm playing with some techniques. I'm not exactly sure that I'm in love with them yet, but hopefully you guys can chime in in the comments and see if you have anything else that you do on the interior glass. Plus, we're gonna be putting a full clear bra on here and of course doing a paint correction and a lot more. So that, coming up on this episode of Drive and Protect. Uh, all the way in. So I think, oh, touch up enough. I can hear it. such a killer blue, dude. If you're unfamiliar with the new GT3, watch any car review video or read any article and you'll quickly understand why this thing is such a beast. The older 3.8 liter has now been replaced with a 4.0 going from 475 horse to now 500. But the six speed manual is what makes this a hot item as the previous generation did not come with this option. Whatever transmission you do get, who cares? It's a GT3 and they're amazing, especially if you drive them hard. Now, just so we can get quickly to the paint comparison part of the episode, here is what I did on all three GT3s when they came off the truck before assessing or comparing the paints in the shop. First, I focused on the wheels by pre-rinsing with water, then I added some plum, then used brute wheel soap and water in the aerator along with wheel brushes and wash mitts. The reason I didn't use a foam gun here is that I might actually hit the paint and have it dry before I could finish the thorough job on the new wheels. Again, this is a convenience thing. By no means is it mandatory. Once I was done, rinsed again, and moved on to the next wheel. Once done with all the wheels, I lightly misted plum again on the lower painted surfaces, the nose, and the trunk to release any brake, factory, or rail dust it may have collected along its journey to the United States. You're asking yourself, yes, you can use certain wheel cleaners that contain sodium thioglycolate, i.e. the color changing characteristic we see on the wheels when you use it, but you can also do it for the paint as it will interact with the iron particles as well. Again, I chose this instead of claying a brand new car in my attempts to adhere to the idea of less aggressive technique first. If the iron wasn't removed with this technique and claying is needed afterwards, then so be it. But in this case, after sitting for about two minutes and without drying, the light iron deposits were eaten away and removed with a power washer during the pre-rinse. For their first full wash, I foamed the paint with Brute and Boost in a 50-50 mixture for some extra kick. Now, going forward, I'll use foam and Boost to maintain and protect the car. However, here I wanted a stronger cleaning to see the paint's true condition. To lightly agitate the foamy paint, I used a technique that's worked since my very first video five or six years ago. Now, instead of using wash mitts and multiple redunks in dirty water, use a clean microfiber towel on all four sides, and when it's dirty, simply get another clean microfiber towel and move on. So yeah, sure, you're gonna use a few more towels, but it's 100% clean. There's no cross-contamination. I usually reserve this technique for super rare cars, soft paint, or black paint, but I now find myself using it more and more these days instead of the traditional wash mitt. I do encourage you to still get the microfiber towels primed first with soap and water if possible. It tends to glide or hover across the paint easier when filled with soap and water. Likewise, a small interior brush can be helpful in the tight spots as well. Once you're done with the light agitation, give it a final rinse and dry with a damp microfiber towel, but without ammo hydrate for this initial inspection and possible polishing. Afterwards, I pulled the cars inside to inspect the paint. Okay guys, start of day three. I wanna give you a little recap of what's going on here. Now I called Dan in from turn seven, you guys know who he is, because uh, we ran into a little bit of a snag. The car over there, Dan's behind the camera panel over there, uh, the GT3 in chalk white. Um, I have my guys helping me out on that side of the car because we saw something, I wasn't quite sure if I liked it or not. So I, if I'm not 100%, I just ripped it off and we're redoing it. So that put us back a little bit. I called Dan in to help me uh, polish this one. We're almost done. We've, we've taken the nose off and the headlights out. But the interesting thing is, all three wings, this, this uh, rear uh, deck lid here, 
they all have pigtails on them at varying degrees. So I would say the chalk white one is, is the worst. I would say this is the second worst, and that one's actually not so bad. Now, take that, put that to the side, look at the paint. The paint is actually in different conditions. This is the best paint that I've seen so far. That's the uh, second best, and this one's the worst. If I take my light out real quick and show you, the paint um, at some point in its life had to uh, have been sitting outside or something. I don't know, I, I, I don't know if you can see that or not, but this needs to be compound and polished. So the quick recap on day three is polish, polish, compound and polish, and then all three wings needed to be almost sanded, compounded, and polished. So there's some interesting things going on because I've never had three cars come out of the factory at the same time, come into the shop at the same time, so that's kind of cool. Right after this, we're gonna work on, uh, once the clear bras are done, we're gonna work on the interior glass, and I'll show you a few steps on how to make that less torturous. First, we masked off the matte intake scoops and polished with a Kevin Brown 1-inch special around the edges of the scoop with M100 and a microfiber cutting pad. Next, we followed up with the 3-inch on the larger areas and finished with M205 on the 3-inch foam pad once again. The paint was relatively soft on all three rear decks and they cut well and finished easily. My guess is the pigtails were present on all decks because the shape and tight working space didn't allow for the best sanding position or line of sight for the worker at the factory. But again, that's just a guess. With the wings completed, the owners asked me to remove all of the badges prior to clear bra and more importantly, they preferred the 997 GT3 badge, which is a little bit bigger than the GT3 that comes with the car, so I'll install the bigger one at the very end of the detail. As I've done in previous videos, I used fishing line and ran it behind the badge and they popped off abnormally easy. Maybe it was because they were just installed a few weeks back, but either way it took less than 20 seconds to remove them from the paint. Afterwards, I gently peeled up the remaining 3M double-sided tape and I was done. No adhesive remover was needed and it was literally this painless. Next, we started the restoration on the paint of all the cars other than the wing and the rear bonnet. To do this, I'm testing out the new buff bright polishing light that connects directly to your polisher and into the threads designed for your side handle. It shines a light directly onto the surface you're working and obviously stays with the polisher as you move it back and forth, so it's certainly convenient. However, I found it slightly cumbersome at times working around the light on both sides of the handle. I'd say one side might be the best as opposed to having two. Likewise, getting used to the new dimensions of the polisher and trying to avoid bumping or scratching the paint is something to consider as well. For me, more testing needs to be done before I can decide if it's something that I'm going to use in the future. For now, I'm sticking with a handheld light and one in the distance at an angle to complete these GT3s. During the Mexico blue polishing, I noticed three spots on the driver's side rear quarter that were unique amongst the GT3s. Okay, so I'm trying to keep you guys in the loop as part of this little documentary, if you will. Um, so I polished uh, the door and most of the hood, and we're working on the roof, and we're going through the whole process as we normally would. But I want to stop every once in a while when I see something that's kind of uh, fascinating, at least to us nerds watching this. Anyways, you see these three pieces of tape. It seems like from the factory, uh, there's a, a one or two inch little, um, maybe denibber or something. So I'll pull the camera in and show you. But I haven't uh, compounded or polished or done anything to this panel, but as I was kind of inspecting it and going over, I was like, you know, I kind of called over to Dan, like, hey Dan, did, did we uh, sand this little spot here? He's like, oh no, we didn't sand anything. I was like, wow. And then I found two more, and then we sort of, you know, looked at it and thought to ourselves, oh wow, this looks, this, like this panel in particular um, must have had some sort of paint defect, and they sanded it out, but they didn't really go through the process to refine it down, which we all know is, you know, in the detailing, from a detailing perspective is, is much harder. Compounding is somewhat easy, sanding is somewhat easy. Refining, that's where the, so to speak, the money is made, or the last 10%, or whatever you want to call it, again, and then we'll, uh, I'll go over the, uh, the trunk lid. We've talked about that a lot, but I can tell you right now that that is being painted or manufactured or built or something in a completely different factory, I'm guessing, or a different method because on every single one of them, uh, you know, there's some sort of uh, refinement issue as well. So I'm gonna keep moving forward, but every time I find something interesting or noteworthy, I'll, uh, I'll hop on camera and show you guys. After compounding and polishing those pigtails out, I wanted to see if the paint thickness on the cars were similar or vastly different. Now the door jams were consistent around four mils. 
while the paint was around five or so. So there's really not a big difference in the consistency of the thickness around the cars. However, the quality of the finish or refinement process might vary because the sanding, compounding, and polishing is most likely done by humans as opposed to machines. So it's not unlikely to have a finish variance when you're done. Uh, we've put clear bra on the front here and the hood, uh, but not the door. This is uh, with no clear bra on it, right? What's that say? Uh, it says six, right? So that's six mil. Now I'm gonna go on clear bra, which is right next to this paint. So I'm going very close. What's that say? 12.5. So basically I'm doubling the thickness, if you will. So essentially there's another six mil of plastic or clear bra on top of six mil paint. So you've sort of doubled your protection for the lack of a better word, but that's not in, in fact true. You've just put six mils of um, clear bra on top of six mils of paint, which I think is pretty cool. Okay, so we just measured the paint on the GT3 and the clear bra and showed the difference about six, seven mils, something like that. Now we have a cup car on the other side of the shop, a speed sport, and it has a vinyl wrap on it. Now I wanna show a little example. This thing has been repainted, but it's irrelevant for this uh, demonstration. So I'm gonna put the paint depth gauge there. It's 12, right? Now I'm gonna go on the vinyl wrap and it's 13. So that's about one and a half mil, obviously, difference. And so clear bra is really focused on protection. So if you're gonna get a rock chip, hey, I'm gonna drive my car and I might get rock chip, your clear bra is paint protection. Vinyl wrap is really to change it. Look at this thing, it's crazy. It's got all kinds of wacky colors and the name of the company and it's a race car. So there's a very big difference between vinyl versus uh, clear bra and, and the big difference would be uh, the protection factor and obviously clear bra is gonna be the one you want if that's what you're looking for. Now I have a video, uh, I'll post a link up here somewhere uh, between uh, showing the differences between the two of them and we really go down the rabbit hole of all the different is the type of material, how much it costs, how long it takes, all that kind of stuff. So if you really want to know the difference or get nerdy about uh, vinyl versus clear brow, check out that video. Once the sanding or denibbing marks were restored, the cars lifted for Brian and Nick to carefully remove the headlights. To do this, they first removed the side markers, under tray, trunk plastics, and then taped off the surrounding paint. If you're wondering why I didn't just wait to polish it when they were done, it's because it's very hard to buff something that is wobbly or wiggly once it's loosened. Plus, these guys are really fastidious about everything, so I knew the paint was going to be untouched. Next, Brian uses a tab puller to remove the plastic component, or the tab, connecting the bumper to the fender. Then, with a few pulls, the bumper was displaced enough to reach the bolts under the headlight. Again, this could have all been done from inside the trunk on previous models, but not on the newer cars. The previous model had a long Allen that would disengage the headlight and remove it. This one you have to pull off the bumper cover to get two 10 millimeter nuts that are underneath. Then the headlight is pulled out of the fender and electrical units detached. Over the next few days, we clear broad every painted surface on the GT3. Now I'll spare you the gory details, but if you want to see an exact step-by-step -step procedure on another Porsche, click the link above. Now, with the bra installed, Brian and Nick came back to reinstall the headlights, put the bumper back in its place, the side markers, under tray, and front spoiler. The owners requested the dealership to not put the front lip on the car because I was only going to remove it a few days later, so that was really helpful. With the front trunk plastics back on, we were good to go and move on to the next step. When we're done with bras, if possible, I like to pull the car out in the sun to help the water evaporate and to inspect every corner, every edge, and look for bubbles that are always present minutes after installation. When I find something that needs further attention, I lightly place a small strip of masking tape near the spot in question and work my way around the car to complete the last 10% of the clear bra job. As we all know, customers, and I'm including myself in this one, we don't remember or appreciate the 99% that went right Instead, we look at the 1% that's not perfect. So this inspection now that I'm doing will hopefully squash that 1% closer down to maybe zero. Likewise, I removed the seat covers, the floor mats, and very carefully removed the window sticker. Now, I never fold someone's window sticker, especially on a new car, because it's bad luck. More on this later. Next, pull it back inside after an hour or two in the sun and clean up the edges and bubbles you found outside. At this point, the bra should be warm and flexible as it helps to work the material when it's a bit more pliable. Afterwards, I quickly vacuumed the carpets and seat, then touched up the interior plastics with ammo lather and added some scotch guard to the carpets because no rubber mats are being used. New to it, uh, new cars in particular have plastic 
uh, that gas out. So these new, they're called plasticizers. These things release from, from the plastic dashboards or the leather and they get stuck to the glass. Now they're always admitting that's the new car smell that you smell, that's that gas. That gas goes through the window, it goes out everywhere, but when it, when it goes, uh, when it's close to the glass, it just cut, raises up, you know, gases out and sticks to it. And that's that yellowy film that you see all the time, super annoying. So the purpose today is to try to minimize that or uh, chew that down for the new owner so he doesn't have to deal with it for a couple of weeks or months. Um, I, again, if you put it in the sun, it'll actually uh, make it worse faster. So that's a little FYI. Anyways, I put a towel here because I'm gonna be using isopropyl alcohol and this is a brand new car. And if God forbid we have a little drip, this is gonna pick it up. So isopropyl alcohol, I have towels everywhere. Again, I'm doing this on camera, trying to do a quick thing. Uh, this is super tight, it's not leaking anywhere, and I would do it outside the car on that side, but I can't uh, do everything and, and film at the same time. I wanted to introduce you to this. I'm not sure if you've seen it. It's a paddle. I don't think there's a specific name for it, but it's just a window cleaning paddle. And on the end right here, there's a little scrub pad so you can actually scrub off that film. So you guys have seen the reach tool or whatever it's called and it's a little triangle and there's a bonnet on it you put the bonnet on take it off put it on put it, and there's microfiber to me that's a little on the slower side because they fill up so fast they get wet so fast so i just interchange microfiber towels and i can literally by doing this i can just scooch it up a little bit do it again scooch it up a little bit so i'm always having a fresh towel without having to pull the bonnet that's kind of my thought process so again i would do this outside the car like this put a little bit of isopropyl alcohol on here this is about a 50-50 or 60-40 uh, mix, just a little bit on the microfiber. And then you're gonna get, hold it with your hand, and then you can reach really, really tight spots. But you're putting a lot of pressure down, more consistent pressure than just say your hand going up like this. So I kind of like this idea. Uh, it seems to be working well for me. Um, again, I'll, I'll shoot more videos and see if I stick with this plan. And then once you have it, uh, you know, you feel satisfied with it, you can literally just take this off put a new towel on, right? And then go back in and clean it again and go through all the steps that we normally do. So anyways, I just wanted to introduce you to this thing. I think it's pretty cool. I'm not 100% sure, but um, this is just like this constant battle. As everybody knows, uh, the joke is I'd rather polish like four cars than do one uh, windshield glass because it's just a nightmare with that film. So stay tuned for more info on this thing. For the other windows, I used a scrub pad to remove the window sticker glue and a small squeegee to see if it was as useful as I hope it is. Now stay tuned, I don't have enough data yet to make a confident recommendation at this time. Next, I bought some frames online and quickly put the window stickers in to protect them for the owners. It'll be a nice touch when they arrive to collect their babies in a few days. Afterwards, I installed the new, bigger badge on the rear bumper. Many of you commented on my Instagram page that I should have just created a template before I removed the previous badges, but since I'm not reinstalling those badges, it became unnecessary. I'd be starting from scratch with its placement, and asking someone who is particular about everything in life to put a badge on perfectly without a template on a supercar is time-consuming. Measure twice and cut once sort of thing was on overdrive. I'm not proud of it, but it took me about an hour and 40 minutes to be happy with its placement. Most of it was just standing and staring to visually measure the gaps. It was an excruciating project. If that wasn't enough, we placed decals along the lower edge of the car on the chalk white GT3. After careful consideration from the owner, we followed the door line instead of the body line. One is parallel to the ground, while the other is parallel to the door. Now, this sounds subtle, but they have slightly different sloping rakes to each. Once the backing is removed, cut around the door and lay the decal around the back, and you're done. Installing is pretty easy. Perfect placement location, however, is mind-numbing and very tedious. Next, I added ammo skin to the rims for a consistent look. These semi-matte-looking rims tend to get blotchy or water spotty if not protected well. Then I added two layers of reflex and two layers of skin over the clear bra. Afterwards, I applied ammo mud to the trim and to the rubber for a little pop before the owners arrived. Truth be told, my favorite part of the job is unveiling the car to the owner, especially if it's new. I usually walk around the car and explain interesting things that I encountered during the job and any helpful maintenance tips that will keep the car in great shape once it leaves the shop. Likewise, I handed them the frame with their window sticker as a thank you for using ammo and answered any questions before their first drive home. 
See you, bud. And as a surprise to me, my buddy Chris let me drive his brand new freshly detailed and freshly broad GT off the lot first, as he knows this is my next dream car. So it was quite special and a little nerve wracking to be the first one to drive his car on public roads. And I haven't stopped dreaming about it since. So with that, I added the Porsche GT3 to my vision wall of cars in hopes that one day my dream will become a reality.